I just want to say it's an honor and a privilege to share my story. I don't get emotional because I'm sad or I'm hurting, but it's what God has done through my life. And I'm nervous right now, so I'm just going to pray real quick. Spirit of the living God, I invite you in every corner of this tent this morning. Father, I ask that your spirit would permeate in this place. Father, open the ears of your sons and daughters to hear from you and open their hearts to receive what you have for them. Father, I thank you for taking all my mess and turning it into a message. I ask you to allow my story to reflect you, that you will hear, that someone will hear something in my story that will unlock and unleash who you call them to be. Father, stir up the gifts you have for them. Do that thing that only you can do when you step into a room. Father, that every yoke will be broken and destroyed. Have your way. And as for me, God, I ask that there would be no nerves, no fear, but your spirit standing strong inside of me. This is my story. I'm a New York Rican. I know how y'all feel about them Yankees. That's all right. But I am Puerto Rican from the Bronx. If you don't see the swag, I don't know what to tell you. But all right. I'm Puerto Rican. Anyway, um, I grew up in a single home with my mom. My mom has 11 children. I am seven out of 11. I know I just said that, seven out of 11. We had a big family. I grew up in a single home. My father was never involved. I didn't know my dad. But my life, it was a lot of trials and error. I grew up at a young age. I didn't have my dad in the home. My mom was, a, was on drugs. My mom had her first child when she was 12 years old. All of us, if that don't tell you that, wow, all of us are a year apart. My mom had kid after kid after kid. Like I said, I'm the seventh. But my mom only had a fifth grade education. My mom grew, she was in the Bronx. And my dad got her on drugs. She, her drug of choice was crack cocaine. My dad was also a user. And drug abuse was just in my family. Not only in my mom, but also in my aunts, my uncles, my whole entire life we had drugs all around us. I grew up seeing it. I grew up hearing about it. I grew up in the crack house. I grew up driving to the drug dealers. My mom changing her name because they was looking for her. I remember getting always, she picks us up in the middle of the night and puts us in the car and takes us to the dope dealers' houses and I would see and I would hear things and I would always hear that name, Maria, Maria. And I was like, mom, that's not your name. And she's like, don't say nothing, they're looking for me. So I grew up in that type of environment, going from home to home, always waking up, there was no electricity, there was no water, there was hardly food. But we kept pushing. My mom was, the little bit that she had, she made sure we ate. If it was a bowl of cereal, if it was white rice and eggs, whatever it was, she made sure we ate. But her drug addiction was more important in her life. I seen it. My mom also, not only drugs, but Abuse happened. She, I, I used to hear the domestic violence, all the men she would bring in the house. I would hear her get beaten, and it was just a sound in my ears to go to sleep, that noise, that cry, that I would hear my mom, and I would just say, God, do you not see it? Where, where are you in this? And it was just one thing after another, and I remember one morning, I would wake up in the morning for breakfast, and I would try to go get a bowl of cereal. And as soon as I opened up the fridge, the gallon of milk would be there, but not the handle. And I would always be like, where the milk go? Like, where, why, why the jar is cut up? But I used to always find that piece with a piece of aluminum for you in every corner of the house. That was her crack pipe. And I would be like, why? And to this day, gallons of milk just triggers me. 
I, everywhere I go, every corner I would go, I would see that pipe and I'd be like, man, what is this? I knew what it was at an early age. I smelled the crack cocaine cooking in the kitchen. I smelled it, I seen it. And it was just that type of life all the time, all the time. And the met, and then the abuse, like I said, I, they, I would hear my mom getting beat. There were mornings that I would wake up and I wouldn't even think my mom would make it. She was so beaten that I'd be like, man, how she, the, I remember the last time she was with a golf, a golf club stick. She was so swollen and so bruised that I was like, why do you stay in this? And I just didn't understand, and it reminded me as I was reading, and I was like, God, what do you want me to share? And I remember John 5, 1, 8, and it was the lame man, and it says, after Jesus returned to Jerusalem, one of the Jewish holidays, inside the city near the sheep, the sheep gate was a pool of Bethesda. The five covered porches, crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, laid on the porches. One of the men had been there for a long time. He asked, would you like to get well? I can't, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the, when the waters bubble up, someone else always gets there ahead of me. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. And as I share that a little bit of my mom, I always ask God why she's not moving. And I noticed my mom was paralyzed. My mom was paralyzed not only like Pastor Nicole talked about last week, it's a sickness Drug addiction is a sickness. Alcoholism is a sickness. And a lot of people stay stuck in that. And my mom was paralyzed year after year. Like that man said, why everybody walk by? She seen people walk by her and all her excuse was, I can't. They made it there before me. And God is saying, are you ready? Do you want to get up today? And a lot of us are sitting paralyzed. That man was paralyzed for 36 years. Some of us are paralyzed for over 36 years because of trauma, because of things that people have done to us. But God is saying, are you ready to get unparalyzed? Get up of the situation while well, my mom's still stuck because she ain't no, no better. And I looked at it. It was a generational curse that kept on following her. And as I seen all that in my life, I said, man, I don't want that for my life. I was in it, I seen it, I smelled it. But one thing I can say, I never tried drugs in my life. I never picked up a I never picked up a cigarette. I never smoked marijuana. I'm not a I don't drink. I never done it. And society and statistics would say I'm a, a product of my environment. But I'm not because I serve a God who does beyond more than I can act. But just because I didn't do the drugs that I seen my mom do because I seen the destruction it did in my family. And I said, man, I don't want that. I don't, if that's what that looks like, I don't want it. So I ran from it, but I was a young girl running, not a father in the home, seeing the things that my mom was up against, so I just ran from it. I didn't run to drugs, but I ran to men. I went, I tried looking for a father figure that I didn't have. And that's many of us girls do that, and we find out that it ain't no better out there. And I was looking, and I was looking, and I was in relationship after relationship trying to find something to fill me, and I know that they're not, no man is going to fill me. So I kept on searching, and I kept on searching, and I was, I was young just searching for love, and they, they, they ain't the one over there. And I was broken. I was a broken little girl looking for answers. I was asking my mom, why this, why that? And I didn't understand. But I had to understand at a young age, I did understand that it was a cycle that she was up against. And it was questions that I asked her. And I said, why are you doing this? And I come to find out that her mom abandoned her too. And it was just generational. And I, and I can tell that having kids don't come with a manual book and she only taught us what she's seen and she she was a young girl like I said at 12 years old with her first child and before she got to me the seventh she she that was all she had 
And I was like, man, like, it was rough. And my mom's drug addiction got more worse and worse and worse. And it came to the point where I got taken away. I remember this day like it was yesterday. I didn't grow up affection. My mom never came to me and hugged me. She never told me she loved me. She never told me she was proud of me. I played sports. I was always the one, like, playing basketball was my biggest passion. Trophies I won. She wasn't there. And I was just so broken. And I remember one day at school, it was uh, uh, one morning at school, I was probably in the fourth grade. I'm in Miami and I'm in school because we're just going from home to home to home. And I went to school one day and that morning I get a call from the office and say, you got to go to the office. I go to the office and they say, hey, we got to take you somewhere. And I'm like, I don't know you. I ain't going nowhere. And they said, no, you have to come with us. And I said, all right, whatever. So I leave. And they said, and I, and I get in the car and I see this sign and it says, as soon as we pull up in the parking lot, it says children and family. And I said, what happened? And that day, my life changed forever. I got taken away. I never got to say goodbye to my mom. I never got to tell her I love her one more time. And I was raised in the foster care for five, six years. I didn't know where my mom was at. I couldn't see her. And my life just shifted. That fast, it shifted. And I knew it was because drugs had a hold of her so strong that she didn't know what to do with her life but to stay stuck there. And I said, man, God, and I cried out to God. And I said, I never, I didn't grow up in church. I didn't know nothing about church. I knew the street life. And I said, man, who's this God thing that people talk about? But I was broken. And sexual abuse began, began, began to happen. And when we was in the foster care, more sexual abuse happened with us. And my little brother, he was four years old, and a teenager ended up sexually abusing him in the system. And I said, man, you took me away from my mom for this to get worse. And my life just got worse and worse. And I didn't understand why, because I said, I didn't do nothing to deserve this. I didn't ask for parents like that. I didn't ask for a, a parent to choose drugs over me or my dad not to be in my life. But God knew, for some reason, he saw fit for me to be their kid. And I look at my, and I say, my dad got eight kids with my mom, and you're not there for none of us? And as much as I got angry and hateful, I said, you know what? I become bitter or I become better. And I decided not to let my life circumstances define me. And as much as I kept on trying to push, I fell, and I got back up, though. I didn't stay down. I didn't stay paralyzed because of my situation. I said, man, I know there's got to be more than this. I know there's got to be a way out from somewhere. And a lot of us are staying stuck. I look at God. I'm, I'm a youth pastor now. And I look at these kids and I'm like, you're stuck because of your life. You're stuck because what your mom or your dad is doing. And it hurts because... They're the first person God gave you. you. They're supposed to love you. But when you don't get that love from that parent, you, don't, you look at God real suspicious. I was like, who is this? My daddy walked away from me. I don't know. He can't love me. And I look at people real suspicious because I'm like, what's your agenda? For, what you want from me? And I, and I heard it so much in my life. And sexual abuse will also have you down, man. I always say to them, the pain ain't your fault, but the healing is your responsibility. Some of us are stuck because of life situations. But I've seen all that growing up. I've seen, like I said, the domestic violence happen and it crushes people. But I always knew God had his hand on my life. There was no way how I made it out. Like, how did I make it out when all that was around me all my life? When I seen everything that I'm in contact with was right there. Why couldn't I say, let me just try that? But I did it. That is only God. 
And I'm like, where, like, why? But I knew God had a bigger purpose for my life. I knew that he was trying to take me out of the gutter. He was trying to pick up, pick me up and say, man, I got more for you. And as much as I try to erase all those pains, God said, I'm going to use it one day for your, glo- for, for your story. And as much as that I didn't want it, God saw fit for it. But I, 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 I say that with that lame man. I can relate to a lot of people in the Bible. I say I can relate to Daniel in the den. I can relate to the woman at the well, but I can also relate to Peter. I cut somebody off real quick and say, God, you heal them later because I'm still half hood and I, and I say I'm holy, but God is still working on me. But I got to tell myself, all right, that Peter side has to, I got to be careful. But I was, I noticed that it was a generational curse and it was coming after me too. And until I got a hold of it and I seen that this is not the life that I want for myself, I had to do something about it. And all, all my life I was labeled of names and I was stupid and I didn't make things right. I was just labels after labels. I will always hear you're going to be just like your mom. And I heard that and I heard that. And like I said, as I was searching for men to try to fill these voids, I ended up being a teen mom. At 16 years old, I had my first child. I dropped out of high school. I had my child and I said, man, I guess that that was right. I'm going to be just like her. I guess my life ends right here. But I remember that night many nights that I had my daughter in my hands and I said, I got to give her a better life. If nobody, if I don't deserve it, she does. And I, and I fought and I dropped out of high school. I didn't have the education and it was everything after me. Like everything was happening. Like also I'm going to go back some, I was in foster care and then I got out and then my aunt Let me not say that because I know a lot of people are watching online and they might get offended. But a lot of my family live around here. And to see what God is doing in my life, a lot of them is questioning it. But they can answer to God about that because I know God's hand is on my life. So a lot of people rejected me, and I was in foster care, and then I got to a point that they said, oh, one of your relatives want you guys. It was me and my sister. And I was like, okay, cool. So we was living in Miami at a foster care system, and then she came and got us. She was living over here. We stood with her for a few months, and it, everything was fine. I thought my life was okay. She would be in church. She, she, she's godly. And she took us in, and her husband was in prison. And she took me and my sister in. And if a lot of you guys know, when you take in a foster care, you get a check, too. You don't just come for free. You come with something. And I think that's what I was worth uh, was a check, maybe. So then she got that. And we stood with her for two, three months. And one day she came to us. And her husband was about to get released. And she came to us and said, you guys got to go now. And I said, we got to go. And she said, yeah, you guys got to go. And that night, we get a a knock on the door. And it was about 12 midnight. And I see a white bus and said, we're here to pick you up. And I I looked at her, and I got so angry and bitter. I said, you used us. You took us back in. You you gave us back up because your husband is out now. And now we we don't belong here now. And I was very angry. I grew up very angry because of things people done to me and the voids that I had. And I didn't understand why people would abuse me. I felt rejected. I felt unworthy. And family would do this to me. And I'm like, is this what family is? I don't want it. Like, I'd rather stay by myself, lonely. And it was hurtful, lonely. But my family was constantly doing stuff like this. And I was like, that's not right. And then you said you was... Godly, I'm sorry, religion is not of God. God wants to build a relationship, and I felt like what she had wasn't that, but that's not me to say I got to leave her to God. But so many people had hurt me, and it left me hurt, broken, 
and reject it, but I knew God had a purpose over my life. And like I said, I was a teen mom, and I wanted better for my future. I wanted better for my children. I said, this cycle breaks today. I said, I would not let my kid be in the same environment that I grew up in. I would do what I have to do. And I did, and I, I dropped out of school, like I said, and I went and got my GED. I fought for that for eight years because I didn't have the education, but I made it. Amen. I got a GED. <laughs> and I did it more for my kids. It wasn't for me. Because I wanted her to see, and now I have two kids. She's my first one, and I have an eight-year-old as well. But I told them that no matter your situation in life, you can come up if you want to. So I'm here to tell whoever is here today, and not only teenagers, but some of you adults are sitting stuck. Some of you guys are paralyzed because of your life situation, because what your mom did to you, or because someone sexually abused you. Leave that person to God, because God will deal with that. That's not unseen, but you deserve to get up and not stay paralyzed. Some of us is always making excuses like, well, that person did that, that person did that. Yeah, they did that to me too, but I chose to get up. I chose to not let bitterness eat me up because that would have got me sick. I would have not got nowhere. So I got into relationships, and my second child before I had her, I was in that relationship, and I was, and, and I was broken. And that's when I said, you know what, I stood in that for five years. And I said, man, it was, it was bad, it was toxic, it was horrible. And I said, I got to get out of this. I said, this is just bad, but then I, I end up having another child. I said, man, I'm stuck again. But something inside of me said, if you want to stay another year, then that's where it's going to be. And I said, you know what, I would pick up my daughter, I would, she would watch me go to his house, slash tires, break windows. I was just a mess. That girl, I was, I was that one. And I would look at her and I'd be like, man, I don't need her to see me do this stuff. But I was so broken in that relationship. I know I don't got a lot of time, but I was so broken. And that was when I said, who is this God that they talk about? Who is this person that people say that he, he sets free, delivers every store? Because I don't know who's, who's going to restore this broken one. Because everybody else said I was damaged. But God says, you're not damaged. You're not, you're not destroyed. I see fit for that. And I remember that day I was driving. I just argued with him. I might have sliced the tire. I don't know. But I left and I got in the car and I, something hit me. And I said, God, who is this person? I stopped in the middle of the road. I screamed and I said, God, if you real, you got to show up. But you got to show up right now. And I got so desperate and I felt it. And he says, are you ready to let go? Are you ready to pick up your stuff and you better walk? And I said, God, I think I'm ready, but I don't know. I still got a kid with him. He said, you let it go. I take care of you and yours, but you got to keep walking. And that day I got on my knees and I said, God, if you if do what only you can do, restore this broken young girl because nobody else don't want to do nothing with her. And God says, I will restore you. I will heal you. And then through that process, it wasn't easy. It didn't come overnight. But it was a walking journey. And I found myself making a step, a step, and a step. But I said, you know what? Brokenness ain't my future. Loneliness ain't mine. It don't belong to me or my kids. But they deserve to see a mama pick her mat up and keep walking. Because a lot of us are staying stuck. Our kids are suffering because of our problems. Our kids are suffering because of stuff we decide to do. If God say, let that person go, let that person go. Stop staying paralyzed. So I did that. I cried out to God and I knew God. God met me where I was. He picked me up. He dusted me off. He put me new and I'm walking with God now. But everybody said I wouldn't made it. And when my, my heart was always, I said, you know what, God, I know that what the enemy meant for evil, you're going to use it. And I knew my story was going to touch somebody, and maybe it's not an adult, maybe it is just a teenager, whatever it is. And God spoke to me and said, you will be a youth pastor. And I didn't understand it. I said, God, I'm broken. Like, there's no way you can use this. And God says, I will use it for my glory. 
And I have the honor to be a youth pastor and pastor these young people. And it's because of what I went through that they can, some of them can relate to. Because I was one of them and said, man, you don't know what this feels like. You don't know what that abuse did to me. You don't know what that smell of crack cocaine did to me. But God is like, I do. I'm going to use it. And if you allow me to, and if you pick up your mat, stop making excuses, stop staying paralyzed, you watch what I do with it. And I told God, I said, all right, God, I'm jumping in the water. I'm jumping in. And it reminded me of Genesis when it says the devil thought he had me. The, the enemy bruised my head, but I crushed his, he bruised my heel, but I crushed his head. And I want you to know that no matter your circumstances, if you pick up your mat and you walk, got to do something with it. Don't let your life circumstances keep you paralyzed or hold you down. Like I said, the pain may not be your fault, but the healing is your responsibility. God wants to do something through this generation. I know it. And then they know what re- these, these teenagers are broken. They're running for drugs and they're killing our kids. And we're sitting here, sitting back and like, okay, God, do something. No, get up and do something. Get up for your family today. Stop letting them suffer. We complain and we do things, but God is saying, I want to do something. I'm raising up a generation. A lot of us need to drop down what we came in here with. If it's sexual abuse, drop it. Let God deal with that man or that woman. He'll do something with it. If it's drug addiction that's keeping you paralyzed, that baby needs you. Your daughter needs you. Your son needs you. That drug is only going to do temporary things. But we know a God that serves doing miracles. He's a well that never will run dry. That drug is going to go for a night. You're going to look for the next high. It ain't going to It ain't gonna do nothing for you. So let's pick up our, bet, our mat today. Let God do something in you today. When my life was falling apart, I looked in the mirror many times and I told myself, I may be broken for a season, but I'm not destroyed. Break, breaking through the dark soil of where I was placed in my life, I began to sprout and rise and, conti- and continue to see another world of possibilities. The dirty places became my nurturing soil that enabled me to grow and blossom in many ways that I never had experience. If I was sitting in the safety of the greenhouse, I was hard pressed on every side, but I was not crushed. I was complex, but I wasn't, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Therefore, I did not lose heart. I want to tell everyone listening today that no matter who you are and where you are in life or where you come from, you must begin to appreciate the ugly stages of your life. It might require you to come forth with a shovel this morning. It might, it might be time for you to dig up the deep roots. But keep, keeping you paralyzed is not your home. But deep down inside, you want to love and be loved and draw close to God, but you're scared. But God wants to do something today. If you're here today and you don't, it ain't you that's in this circumstance and it's a daughter of yours, because I know all of us is going through something. The drug addiction is so real that it's got so many caught up. But that's your loved one, whoever it is. Pick pick it up today for them. A lot of them are paralyzed and don't know how to get up. I was praying for my mom many years. Drug addiction had her, like I said, for many years. But I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And today my mom is 17 years sober. The mom that I didn't have as a little girl that I wanted so bad, God knew that if I was there, I would have probably been broken. But God told me, continue to pray for her and don't give up on her because they're in addiction. If you got somebody that's battling with addiction, prayer does everything. It moves mountains. Don't ever give up on that person. And I prayed and I prayed and the little girl... I wanted my mom, and she couldn't be that for me, but I had two kids, and my mom is the best grandma I can say. She's able to see my kids. She's able to enjoy them and love on them, and she looks at me, and she says, man, I didn't have this with you, 
but you're giving it to me with my grandkids. So I want, as you guys stand up today and prepare, because I know I'm out of time. I couldn't tell you my whole life story. I got so much more, but they only give you 15, 20 minutes. I can't tell you everything. But those were big things in my life, and I know God wants to use it for somebody. I don't know who you are here today, but drug addiction got you bound. Sexual abuse has you hostage. You're not forgiving somebody. And God wants to do something with that. God wants to say, God is saying this morning, don't be paralyzed of your circumstances. Get up today, pick up your mat and walk. Don't live another two years, five years, six years paralyzed because what somebody did to you. God is calling. God has been ringing the alarm and say, man, let that go. Let that bitterness go. That person took something from me and I didn't ask for it. But like I said, the healing was my responsibility and I had to get up today. The blessing was when I see my mom restored. My mom ain't all there yet and I'm okay with that. But she's set free from drugs. And now she can be a grandma and now she can see me. And to know that my, my mom is also watching online today and I know she's proud of who I became. But as I look around this crowd, I feel it so strongly that so many are bound. So many are. Maybe you never got sexually abused or maybe you didn't do drugs. But I was running to men and I couldn't find a way out. And until I let go of that relationship, and it's been about six years now, it's me and God. I'm in a relationship with me and God. I don't need nobody else. It's me and my kids and it's me and God. Because God wants to restore me. There was things that I wanted to share, but I didn't have time to that. I had to uproot those things, and I said, God, I bury that thing. I don't want to re- I don't want to pick that up. And God says, you need to pick it up. You got a story to tell. And like I said, it's not mine. It's his, and he wants to use it for his glory. So as, as they sing, these altars are open. If you need something that you need to release, today is to let it go. If our intercessors can come up for prayer.